this video will be significantly shorter than the previous two. Its primary purpose is to show the method for writing up the two-way analysis of variance results that we've already computed, and it ends with just a brief overview of the logic and the method. So let's dig in. This is just a summary of our results so we can remember what we have to work with as we begin this report. Our original data looked at three sizes of cars and two types of filters on the exhaust system to see how noisy the cars would be with that noise as the dependent variable. We used the ANOVA two-factor with replication um, a method from the data analysis tool pack and it generated all of this output but in black and white. The color was added later. Drawing out the averages from the two types of filter, I created a table of means and from that table of means I generated a graph. So those are the elements that we have to work with along with of course our actual p-values from the f-tests that go with the ANOVA as we go to write up the results. Our three tests that we did with our analysis of variance results asked us whether car size is related to noise level once I've controlled the filter type. Is the filter type related to noise level if the size of the car has been controlled? And is there some combination of size of car and filter type that is either especially loud or especially soft? And we computed a separate f-test for each of these questions and found that we did have significant results for each of these different f-tests. In writing up the results, we'll use the sandwich method we've used before and we'll make one big sandwich with an introduction at the very beginning and a conclusion at the end and in the middle all of the descriptive statistics and the results for all three of the f-tests and their effect sizes. So there's a lot of quantitative middle and only a small amount of the narrative of the bread on either side of our um, write-up that we'll have for this test. So in the first of four slides for this report, I have the opening narrative and then I report the descriptives. The opening narrative is the part that tells my reader what my research situation was and what questions I was asking. So I say I was dealing with the manufacturers of the new octal pollution filter who said that it did not affect noise level, that's my outcome variable, in cars of all sizes. So I say that I had a test of 36 cars, half of them had the octal pollution filter and half had a standard exhaust system. I say that the cars were divided equally among the size groups of small, midsize, and large, and then I begin to report the descriptives. I chose to use a table rather than report all six means in the narrative. Often this is a good thing to do. I might have added in the narrative that the small size cars seem to be fairly noisy. Some of the mid-size cars were quite noisy, but that for sure the large cars were the quietest. Or I can just leave that for the reader to see when the person looks at my table. The second of the four slides on for this report looks at both the significance tests and the effect size because those are usually reported together. And I've broken it up to look at the three tests that we ran separately so that there's three parallel sets of report. I first looked at the size of the car. I said that it had a significant effect. I have to say which statistic I computed the degrees of freedom, which I got off of the ANOVA table, and the actual calculated F statistic, as well as its p-value. In this slide I just said p less than 0 .001 because I did not want to report all of those six digits um, knowing that it's less than 001 is enough. 
and I go on seeing as I had a significant result. If I had a significant result, I went on to say what was the effect size. I said it accounted for the vast majority. This is narrative English so that my readers who are not so up to date with statistics know what I'm talking about quantitatively. And then I use the numbers to back myself up. I tell them that my eta squared was 0.872. And if you remember, that meant that about 87% of all of the variability in noise was related just to the size of the car. I go on to the second test and say that when I have the impact of size controlled, the filter type was also significant. And here again, I've computed my F results with the degrees of freedom in parentheses and the calculated statistic. And I wrote P equals 0 0.004 because I could um, fit that size in within without too many decimal places. And I say that the Octel filter showed lo lower noise levels than the standard system, but when the car size was controlled, it was only accounting for 4% of the variability. And again, I put in my eta squared for the effect size. And the third thing that I report is the interaction effect Again, the same report of the F-test statistic. I can put in the actual p-value, and I say that it accounted for about 3% of the variability, and I put in my eta squared there as well. And in fact, when I look at this, I think this may be an incorrect eta squared. And if I were writing this up, I would go back before I submitted to a journal and double check to see whether I might need a different number in that location. The third of the four slides interprets the interaction effect. Whenever I say that there is a significant interaction, it means that some combination of my two variables makes something either particularly noisy or particularly quiet it, using the outcome variable of noise level. And so I need to see where that interaction occurred. One of the best ways to do that is with a graph. That's why I made a graph when we were making the results. In the report, I would include the graph. So I'm going to call it figure one. And I'm going to say that it shows that the interaction affects midsize cars. So I say that small cars are relatively noisy with filter having little impact. I've got a high noise level. The octel is quieter, but only by a teensy amount. And I can also say that large cars are relatively quiet. They have the lowest noise level, again with the filter having little impact. But for the mid-sized cars, I see the standard filter being more noisy than even a small car, and the octel filter being slightly quieter than the, it is for the small cars. In my narrative, I say the impact of the octel filter on noise seems much more pronounced. So by showing the graph and writing about it, I've given away for both the statistically sophisticated person and the one who's not as comfortable with statistics to understand what that interaction term means. Finally, I need to write the second part of the sandwich, the narrative that pulls it all together. So I can say that in general, the car's noise level is much more strongly related to their size than to the type of exhaust system. And that's actually based on my eta squared effect size computations. I can say that when the octel filter is used, noise levels are reduced on all cars, and especially on mid-size cars. I'm reporting my interaction effect there. And my very final concluding sentence says, there's good reason to continue the trials of this pollution-reducing filter. So I've drawn all of the studies together without using any numbers in this closing part. If somebody were trying to read this study and did not understand and perhaps even were fearful of all the numbers, this last paragraph would nonetheless convey the most important information to them. 
you'll see that I've put a note at the bottom. Sometimes, especially if a factorial ANOVA involves three or four independent variables, rather than discuss each of the significance tests individually, it may be that a table is put forward that just shows the sum of squares, maybe even just the F test and the p-value, and it uses asterisks to designate whether it was significant at 0 0.05, 0.01, or 0 0.001. So if you see that with the asterisks, just be aware that it means they did a hypothesis test and they're in essence showing you just three levels of p-value. It would mean that the absence of an asterisk was a test that was not significant. So now that we've looked at all of the parts, this last couple of slides will just sum up how these different components work together. If we looked at the total variability, it would be uh, related to the sum of squared deviations from the mean. And so in this slide, I've taken the result of the F-tests that we had from our Excel data analysis tool pack and related it to the conceptual diagram that we had in the first video. So my sum of squares total is shown at the very bottom of the ANOVA table and the sum of squares within is right above it. And then the between sum of squares in our table is not shown as one solid whole, but rather its three components are shown as the sum of squares related to each of the three aspects of the test. So the ANOVA table, as it comes out from Excel, does not really show us that between treatments results collectively. It just shows it to us in the three components. And then, of course, it computes across to make the mean square and ultimately the three F statistics and their p-values. So the conceptual notion of breaking down the variability into a systematic component and an error component and then looking at the systematic component in terms of the aspects that make it up is reflected in that analysis of variance table. So having completed the write-up, you're definitely ready to be working with the ANOVA table quizzer. You now should understand what the three systematic components are and the error or random component and how they add up for both the sum of squared deviations and the degrees of freedom, how they divide across to make the mean squares, and then how each of the mean squares when divided by the same mean square for error creates an F statistic. So I get one for each of the three systematic components. If you have not yet tried the ANOVA table quizzer, click on the link that's in Blackboard and head over. Start with the easy ones, work your way up to the difficult ones. The two-way analysis of variance is the most complicated thing that we will do in this course. From here on out, we use some of these same concepts when we look at repeated measures ANOVA, and when we go on to correlation, regression, and this week to the chi-score analysis, you will find that both the concepts and the computations are quite a bit easier. Congratulations on having made it through the most difficult part of the course.